Welcome to the seventh look at Holy Habits. My name is Paul Whittle, I'm the moderator of the Eastern Synod and sharing leading these reflections on Holy Habits with Lindsay Brown, our Mission and Training Officer, and Nicola Greaves, our Children and Youth Development Officer. In this session, I'm going to take a look, a biblical look, at the Holy Habit of Giving, or putting it another way, sharing resources. In the book that sparked all this thinking, Andrew Roberts' Holy Habits, he says of this particular habit, when it comes to thinking about the holy habit of giving, we need to start by locating that thinking within the generous, extravagant even, persistent giving of God. That is so true. What is God's giving like? Well, the psalmist put it like this in Psalm 23 and verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. My cup overflows. That's the picture. The Gospels put it even more powerfully. John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. It's often said that money was the second most common topic on which Jesus spoke, the most common being the kingdom. But though Jesus often talks about money, as Robert says, he never does so in a legalistic, percentage-based, prescriptive way. Rather, he uses stories and examples to point people to the divine impulse of generous giving. There are many Bible passages with something to say about giving. If you want to explore a range of those, one good way of doing that is to get hold of the relevant little volume in the Holy Habits Bible Reflection series. Each volume takes one of the holy habits and offers a series of 40 Bible readings and reflections. You could use them as a set of Bible reading notes and spend 40 days with one particular holy habit. They're all available as books or, or booklets, really, and some, though not all, are available electronically. I want to focus on just one key Bible passage. But one of the great comments on giving, some verses from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 6 to 15. Let's hear it. The point is this. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Here Paul exhorts the Corinthian Christians 
to be generous. One of the most obvious forms of our giving is our weekly offering. We give cash and without that the church would not survive. It is an important part of our stewardship. But we also give in many other ways. For example, we give time. We use our skills and talents. We offer service in a whole range of ways. All this giving is valuable. Paul recognises that and encourages us to give generously and joyfully. He reminds us that giving and receiving are connected. He comes very close to saying, give for giving benefits the giver. Paul begins this encouragement to generous giving by using a farming image. Verse six, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Through farming, he demonstrates the importance of generous giving. You need to sow plenty of seed if you want to reap a good harvest. Paul might be thinking of Proverbs eleven twenty four: Some give freely, yet grow all the richer. Others withhold what is due and only suffer want. But whether or not he has that particular text in mind, what is clear is that, as John Proctor puts it in his commentary on Corinthians, lavish giving will do much good. Modest and measured giving should always expect a thinner return. Our motives have a profound influence on how things go for us. If we are positive towards others, they are far more likely to be positive towards us. If we are negative towards others, that equally is likely to produce a negative reaction. Verse 7 then develops some thinking around motives for giving. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Sometimes something will happen which makes us feel that we just have to give something. The response to disasters of all sorts and the appeals arranged by the Disasters Emergency Committee is an obvious example. The annual BBC appeal for children in need is another. Situations are brought to our attention we see desperate need portrayed and we are moved to respond. That's great. There is nothing wrong with it. It raises huge sums of money, which does a massive amount of good. Such spontaneous giving makes a major contribution to how we human beings care for each other. But. It should not be the whole story. Like Paul, I would want to say that we ought to consider and plan much of our giving, not least because it is not only the emotive or headline things that need our support, important though they may be. We need to plan to give. We need to think about what we can reasonably give. Our stewardship is an important part of our discipleship. Paul talks about deciding what to give. He talks about giving willingly. What he actually says is not to give reluctantly or under compulsion. He talks about giving cheerfully. When Paul talks about God loving a cheerful giver, his sort of quoting Proverbs 22 9, those who are generous are blessed. It's not an exact quote and if this is Paul's source he is probably quoting from memory and hasn't quite got it right. Or maybe he is deliberately adapting the text a little in order to emphasise the point he wants to make. He certainly encourages the Corinthian Christians to be committed and cheerful in their giving. Apart from anything else, if that is how we approach giving, 
it will be a good experience. On the other hand, if we grudge what we give, it will only build resentment. A cool and calculated approach to giving is likely to reflect our concern with ourselves. A generous and cheerful approach, albeit a sensible one, is likely to build our commitment as disciples of Jesus. Whatever people give, regardless of why they give it, it is to be welcomed. A large gift to a charity, even if it is just to salve a conscience, can still do a lot of good. But the best giving, however large or small, is the giving that is motivated by a generous spirit. Paul goes on to stress the generosity of God. Verse 8. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. When Paul talks here about having enough of everything, he is using the Greek word autakia. This does not describe someone who just has loads of things. It is rather about independence. It is about having what you need not what you want, not piling stuff up, but enough. It's not talking about the person who has directed life to amassing possessions, but rather the person who has learned to be content, to value what she or he has, even to do without things. Pushing it a bit further, we could even suggest that the person described here is the person who recognises that you can't buy the most important things. That person is ready to give because they're not trying to accumulate for themselves. It's often true that we want so much for ourselves that there is nothing left to give to anyone or anything else. Paul is clear as to that not being a Christian approach. Paul then quotes from Psalm 112. This psalm is a psalm that describes the life of a righteous person who lives in what the psalmist often calls the fear of the Lord. That is not the fear of being afraid. We might talk rather of awe or reverence. Such a person who lives in relationship with God shares their wealth and well-being as a matter of course. That is the pattern of life to which Paul invites the Corinthians. Verses 10 and 11 use the harvest as a metaphor. A generous God supplies the seed, the means to give. Then people sow it and God turns it into harvest. There is something here about partnership. I still wonder at the fact that God chooses to use us as partners. It's the whole being the body of Christ thing. We are partners with God and as such we are called to reflect God's generosity. We are called to a ministry of sharing. We need to live lives that demonstrate a spirit of thankfulness. Verses 12 and 13 reinforce the point. Paul talks about our service and our generosity in sharing. This is the gospel. Paul is clear that the two great commandments of love to God and love to neighbour are inseparable. You simply cannot have one without the other. And so he moves quite naturally from saying something about our response to the needs of others to saying something about the glory of God. What we do reflects on the one whom we follow. We are God's people. And that being so, we need to reflect God's light and love. And so the final two verses of this passage point us towards God, and that's important. I'm reminded of a little story 
a small boy who was helping a farmer to gather strawberries. And as a reward, the farmer said that he could keep a handful for himself. Instead of doing what many would and rushing to grab that handful, the little boy looked down at his small hands and then up at the big burly farmer with his large hands and asked, please, could it be your hand? There is similar wisdom for us in looking at the giver rather than the gift. And so verses 14 and 15, they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. He talks then about God's surpassing grace, about God's indescribable gift. Words cannot measure God's goodness to the world in Jesus. Paul is effectively saying to the church at Corinth, can you, who have been treated so generously by God, be anything else but generous to your fellow human beings. 